on the original schedule because there are too many people coming through the BHI that would be of interest for us to hear. Uh, and so it will um, continue into uh, December 17th. So we have a colloquium on the 3rd next week, the week after the 10th, and then the 17th. And then by that time, uh, we are getting into the no, holidays. No colloquium on 24th. Yes. Um, and then uh, the second announcement is that we, on the 17th we will have a winter party uh, which will take place here. But there are three speakers scheduled, so uh, after they are done, probably at around 3 p.m., we'll have to give a hand to uh, Jesse and clear the uh, chairs so that we can have the party later on. So just uh, for the young people around, just be ready to help uh, Jesse. Okay, and uh, we'll start with uh, two, uh, and someone will introduce you with two presentations, uh, three presentations. Two, only two, less two. Only two. Okay, so who is, uh, yes. Uh, my first speaker today is Wolek Kulzniak. Wolek is a professor at uh, Nicolas Copernicus uh, Center in Warsaw. And recently, Wolek was involved in the discovery of uh, gamma ray burst afterglow, with the HES collaboration, which is not the subject of this talk. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to talk about uh, some results of Tenga simulations of uh, thin accretion disks. These are GR simulations uh, where the accretion disks around like holes. Uh, I think it was known already to the ancients that uh, solid bodies. Can you hear me at the back, or can I mm -hmm. wrap up my volume? That uh, solid bodies uh, give out particular tones. In other words, they have mode. So I think of bells and other ancient musical instruments. And I'm not sure if you'll find it in Cicero, but it is known that uh, Roman legions marched across bridges built by Roman. Years, I'm sure that they knew about resonance as well. And before I get to the simulations, I'd like to show the report transparency is motivating to talk that is a little bit of connection to the observations and why it is that we are talking about modes of thin disks. So before there was a black hole shadow, there was an idea to going back actually several years before this work that I'm showing here, that to, to, to get a handle on the uh, metric around black holes by, by doing tiny observations. And uh, uh, some years ago I was interested in neutron stars, and it turns out that uh, if you take a thin accretion disk, you can fit the standard neutron star model inside the innermost uh, circular orbit. So to a certain extent, accretion disk around stars and black holes are very similar. So the idea that we had some hundred and thirty four years ago was that if you have a clump in a thin accretion disk, then it will give rise to a certain timing signature that can be observed at a regular frequency. And this being a thin disk, we know that uh, the motion of matter is supported by rotation, so in other words, the orbital velocities of the Keplerian velocities are good now, and we can compute the, the frequency, the orbital frequency, as a function of the distance from the source, as a function of the mass. This is a trivial dependence frequency is inversely proportional to the mass in, in GR, and as a function of the spin. So, for example, in the Schwarzschild metric. For a 1.3 solar mass star, you get a maximum frequency at the minimum stable orbit of some 1.5 kilohertz, and a correspondingly lower frequency for a black hole. But if you spin up the central object, then the ESCO moves in, and the maximum frequency goes up. So, so the idea was that you can have clumps in the disk. Okay? And such clumps have recently been observed around the Sagittarius A star. 
the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy by the gravity experiment, but unfortunately they are not at the ISCO. And for the bright sources, we'll be talking about uh, like uh, black holes and neutron stars. Before you take it away, um, there is a radius to the neutron star, right? Uh, where is that on this? The radius of the neutron star itself. Right, so the so radius is, is uh, I mean, in this case, it's within the ISCO, the ISCO for far to the six, so. So here it's, let's say, about five. So yes, you're right. So uh, if the star, this is in the in the slow spinning limit of the neutron star. If the star spins up very fast, it actually develops an equatorial bar about. It gets deformed, and also the ISCO is drawn in. So at a certain point, yes, there is no more gap. Right. So yes, so there is enough for, for, for rapidly rotating neutron stars. The highest. Uh, Frequency is the order of frequency of the surface of the star. It also depends on the equation of space, I have to say, to be honest. So there, um, I think the softest equation of space are ruled out now, but, but there, but there still is a concern that anyway. We'll be talking about black holes. So <laughs> the point is that uh, these bright systems we used to cope, right? So yes, there is a beautiful frequency detected by the Rossi X-ray. Planning Explorer. It is a perfectly right uh, magnitude, the kilohertz. So for a true solar mass flex neutron star, this would be perfectly good. However, this is not a club. Already from the discovery paper, when you look at this, so this is uh, the power density spectrum as a function of frequency. This is uh, like some quasi periodic oscillation, it's called because not a coherent frequency, but what you can see immediately there are no harmonics. If there were a clamp rotating, then it would, in addition to the fundamental, it would have harmonics. So this is not a clamp. It's a, okay. So what else are we left with? I think the uh, uh, oscillation modes of addition gates, which actually have been discussed uh, even a decade earlier prior to the discovery by Sergei Popper and, and Gregor Gladiner. Another surprise is that there are in neutron stars there are two, two peaks. Sometimes there's one, sometimes it's one or the other. The observers have a way of identifying them to various phenomenological approaches. Some, sometimes there are both of them at the same time as here, but you never see three kilohertz peak nodes. Okay. So that's a puzzle. And uh, after thinking for it a long time, so we came up with Marek Abramovich with the idea that this is connected to some kind of phason phenomenon. And we submitted a paper which was promptly rejected by the referee saying there is no evidence for quantization of, of frequency. With hindsight, I think even in this discovery paper, you can see that one is 900 and the other is 600, so there is like a ticket deviation. And anyway, very soon, Dick Stromer discovered a, a second peak building a black hole candidate, not a black hole, let's call it. 16 to the power minus 40, and you clearly see 40 kilohertz and 300 hertz and you see a complete reduction. So I think that there are three other systems, at least two other systems, in which black hole systems, in which uh, stellar sites, black holes, in which two frequencies are known, and they are all in, in the station. So I think that's a strong argument that there is a right answer in the system. Okay, so much for the introduction. Uh, oh, yes, sorry, one more slide. There are also white dwarf systems, in which a similar frequency. <laughs> Similar phenomena is observed, but here there's only one frequency. Again, as you can see, there's like two different views of the same thing for SSC. Uh, again, you see there are no harmonics. Okay, so again, this is some kind of oscillation problem. And uh, I haven't mentioned it in the other sources, but in all those sources, there is like a lower frequency thing, the PO, perhaps, uh, like a factor of 10 or 9 or 11 lower. And uh, people have plotted up frequency against frequency. Yes, and, uh, and there is a very nice correlation and that uh, satisfied for black holes, neutron stars, and also for, for white dwarfs. So it's the same phenomenon, apparently, from the phenomenological point of view. The frequency is characteristic of, of the expected radius. And the difference is that in relativistic systems, like neutron stars or black holes, you have two frequencies, and in white dwarfs, you have one. So the idea is then to look for something which 
in the Berlin physics is around Ludwig Lenske and the relativistic uh, physics. And there is uh, the link, and there are called epicyclic frequencies, for example, the vertical and radial epicyclic frequencies, which is the ion's property. This in order to impression of something with them, something. So, yeah. so uh, let's say that this is the equatorial plane of Saturn, so these things move around in circular orbit. But this stone is raised a little bit, which means it's on an inclined orbit. Okay, that means that from the point of view of this stone, it will have the same circular uh, orbital velocity. So from the point of view of this stone, this, this stone will just be going up and down, up and down. And this is the vertical cyclic frequency. And for any spherical body, black hole or Saturn, this frequency is equal to the orbital frequency. You may also think of perturbing one of those stones in the radial direction. And then in Newtonian physics, it would go on an elliptic orbit, which is closed. So once again, we know that this back and forth motion, radial motion, in Newtonian 1 over r potential has the same frequency as the orbital motion. So in Newtonian physics, 1 over r potential, both these vertical and radial epicyclic frequencies are the same, and they are also the same as the orbital motion. All right, so these are test particle frequencies, but now we can move to the fluid and hydrostatic equilibrium. So for example, a ring, okay, so this is a ring, ring, but let us think of a, of, of a real ring, a torus. A torus, which is in hydrostatic equilibrium. And you can take all the stones of the Saturn rings or all the fluid particles of the torus and just lift it up out of the plane and let it go. And then the torus as a body will move up and down. So it's an exact mode of a slender torus in fluid body. And another mode would be to, to, to make the radius of the torus smaller or larger. Okay. And this is also an exact mode of this fluid body. So there are two modes, which are Newtonian physics. And, and it happens that the frequencies are exactly equal to the test particle frequency. So there are two modes, at least two modes. Uh, whose frequencies in Newtonian physics are the same, but in GR, the radial, at least for, for, for bodies like black holes, uh, or collocated orbits, uh, the radial epicyclic frequency is always lower than the vertical. So in GR, there is a splitting of the frequency. So given that, this is not a simulation, a ray tracing calculation based on an analytical model of the torus and its motion. Given that, you can take a torus and let it oscillate vertically and let it oscillate radially. Let's say the two frequencies are metrically creation, and then compute the light curve and take the power Fourier transform and get the power spectrum, and you will see two beautiful peaks. The relative size of the peaks depends on the inclination. The, the, the higher frequency peak is stronger when you're looking at one. And let me stress that I heard told you that in Newtonian physics there would be just one frequency to get the imaginary. But also, you would never see the higher peak because in Newtonian physics, if the thing just moves with a constant aspect to the observer, and it's a very distant source, there is really no modulation of light at all. All the modulation of light here comes ray tracing because right, okay, so, so so the higher peak then would, would be split from the lower peak and you see now a beautiful relativistic effect okay. for black hole I, for black holes I thought for taking black holes the polar frequency is also different from the azimuth right? so so for rotating black hole the 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 the, 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 the speed split completely so right. For a rotating orbit, the highest is the orbital, the, uh, the vertical epicycle frequency, and then the radial epicycle. All right. So, in addition to those two modes that I discussed, when this is the cross section of the torus, so the radial motion and like this, or the vertical, which are essentially rigid body motions, there are also internal motions of the torus. So, for example, there is a breathing mode where you know the Torus so that expands and contracts. Okay, there is for a torus, there is also another similar mode where the inner 
where it expands and contracts, you know, in, in the radial direction. Okay, and there are. Okay, so. Um, I still have a quadrature performed. And yes, I think it's more zero pound. So I was able to perform um, the simulation. Uh, so this is a torus uh, in uh, the black hole is somewhere there. In hydrostatic equilibrium, this would be cross section, and then we gave it a kick in some direction, various directions. And, and then the, the torus responds by oscillating. And uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can see in the simulation all the different internal modes, with the exception of one. So there is the PD mode, the X mode, and others, and you know, by looking at the, at the time already from the, from the movie you could And this is different in the initial percentage. This is different percentage in the initial percentage. That's right, yes. So, so we either kick it vertically or horizontally, or at the diagonal, because Otherwise, yeah, it would just be. Does yeah. this oscillation persist or will it bend out all the time? Sorry? Will this, will this, let's say, will this oscillation persist for, let's say, the accretion time of the torus, or will it bend out? Okay, so this is not a kicking torus. This is an okay. We, we, we do not have. Uh, but I mean, MRI here. Right. So, so yes. If but I mean, because the internal motions, the internal, motions, the internal motions will be done. This this rigid like for the motions will not be done. So I think uh, that's very interesting. Okay. Anyway, so uh, uh, right. So we're able to identify the modes of, of this uh, of this torus of the simulation of the analytic modes, and also we were able to to, to simulate tori of various size up to very very thick disks. And you can sort of trace the the sequence of, of, of frequencies for, for this story. And the conclusion is therefore that the analytic theory works. Okay. And it, and, and for thick tori there are equivalents, equivalent modes to the standard torus and the frequency depends on the size of the torus. Okay. So tori are easy to get there. Okay. It's still more challenging numerically because there are two different scales. Okay, so that that's you know, not really stuff you can do them. Okay, but we are trying to, to do regular simulation. And let me just summarize the, the situation in case I run out, out of time. Excuse so, me. Uh, if you have a two take disk, for me? If, if you have a two take disk, could it be possible that the frequency for this direction and this direction they, they meet together? Right, so uh, you can pick up, yes, uh, I'm not sure I'm yeah. answering then your question exactly, but yes. No, but then the amplitude would be change over the time. Let me say that even if you do not fill the disk, there is a mode called the corrugation mode, which sort of corresponds <coughs> to the field of torus, if you like. So let me start with the torus, okay, which I described already. So as when I said the vertical oscillation, this is an end. It's an n equal to zero mode, so it's actually symmetric. But you can fill the torus like this, okay? And then partial geometry, which is very symmetric, nothing will happen. It will just stay there because n orbital plane is the same. Okay, but in the curved geometry, it will start to I'm not sure if I asked you a question. Yeah, then they, they mix together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so this. Uh, uh, there is a pair of, of, of oscillations that can be typically with those by such cathodes with the mobile organized, and uh, it has never, these oscillations have never been seen in NHD simulations. And the thinking is that MRI modes simply feed that uh, paradigm on these oscillations. So, so they are. Okay. However, in simulations which have no MRI, no NHD, but simply were high drop simulations. This could first be reported in sodium thermal calculations by, by, by Chris Reynolds and his collaborators. And, uh, so we did, essentially we repeated those simulations, but in, in GR and with radiation. 
And the answer is yes, we do see some of the exchanges found, in particular the DG mode. And also for the first time we do some other than for the summary of the uh, 10 year effort by Bob Wagon as group at Stanford. There is the G mode, which is the gravity mode, which is trapped and then to we'll talk about it later greater extent. And then there is the corrugation mode, which is related to your question, which corresponds to the precession and sometimes called the last year precession of the perpetuity ring. So for the Schwarz, this is uh, the spin of the black hole of the nationals, so from Schwarz with the maximal pair. These are the frequencies in Hertz for a tensile mass black hole. So the G mode has a frequency of if for a maximal spinning black hole of uh, for tensile mass it will be go up to 200 Hertz. So for a six solar mass black hole it will go up to 200. We don't change much with the frequency mm -hmm. with the spin of the black hole. The corrugation mode changes a lot because for short hole there is no precession. So, so um, yes. Uh, and as you spin up the black hole, then the difference between the orbital and the vertical and circuit frequencies goes up rather radically and you can go to very high frequencies. There are also trash waves. All right, so this is the Reynolds metal simulation from 2009. So this is a black hole, the companion star with this. And the distance from the black hole is going down. That's why I flip the picture. Frequency goes this way. This is the the orbital frequency, the dashed line, the white line, right, which I'm not sure you can see, is the radial epicyclic frequency. So it has a maximum and then goes to zero at the distal. The color is is the the power in at any particular frequency and radius. So this is a power density spectrum. And uh, it roughly follows the epicyclic, radial epicyclic curve. And then there is a lot of power under the maximum of the radial epicyclic curve. And this is what you expect for a horizontal node, which has first been, um, I think, noted by, uh, by uh, Sergei Kato and his collaborators uh, in 97 or so. So this is the radius in terms of, of the end. This is once again the regular epicyclic frequency. And the point is that there is a, a mode driven by whether the starting force is gravity or rotation, depending on how you look at it, which is trapped right below the maximum of the epicyclic curve. So in this figure, the frequency is drawn for all radiators. So the first step is the mode, the global mode of the disk. But really, outside the epicyclic curve, which are evanescent waves, so, so the amplitude will be vanishing here. So you expect a lot of amplitude here, and this is what they know about. Now, our simulation, surprisingly, looks like this figure. So in addition, so I'm going to show that. In addition to the power right at the top, at the maximum of the epicyclic curve, you also see power to the right and to the left. And this was a surprise, and this is a, this worried us a little bit. The question is, is this really a G mode or is it something else? So this is a red line to have its own. So the most striking feature, so once again, this is frequency in dynamical units. This is the radius in units of mass. This is the ISCO. So the most striking feature here is a essential white noise at the ISCO. So this we will ignore. This is, this is like a waterfall really. From the disk comes to the east current and it spills over and plunges and waterfalls at this point. Very nice. Okay. There is some power here. Oh, sorry, this is a power density spectrum, I have to say, of the mass accretion rate. Okay. So there is some power here following the radial epicyclic frequency, mostly outside of it. So possibly it is, uh, it is excited by, by the radial motion. It will be focusing here. Okay, so between this curve and the ISCO, uh, people who worked on this analytically said it is possible to trap pressure waves. So maybe this is a, a trap pressure wave that you are seeing here. So the question is is this a G mode 
or this thing, or is this a special <coughs> way that actually is translated from this word to this one? So the alternative to, to the G mode in E would be that uh, this is a special way, so this is a spectrum, again I have shown it. It was all radiate, but but really the, the pressure waves are trapped here with the continuum spectrum and this good spectrum. And uh, let's look at the ninth member of the discrete spectrum, which is nine modes on the left. Okay. So this would be a trapped pressure wave, except that the frequency, which is in green here, is so close to the maximum of the epicyclic that even though the wave becomes evanescent, it sort of rebounds and you have transmission of this, of this wave from the left hand side to the right hand side. So, so it is possible in principle that uh, it would, we are looking at the transmitted, uh, the transmitted pressure wave and we'd like to rule it out. So the first thing we do is we look at the power density spectrum of the pressure. This one looks quite different, all right? There is still some here and some here, but it's nothing under the nothing under the maximum. So it does not look like it's a pressure wave. The second thing you can do is to look at the space-time diagram. You know, this is radius, this is not frequency, this is not time. Okay, the color shows you the direction of oscillation in envelope in the most efficient way. The blue is away and red is forward, but you can see in the inner part of the disk, you can see us stretch back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But if you look very closely here, okay, you can see that there is curvature to the left and to the right, which means that something is propagating to the right. As time goes on, things are moving to the right, and as time goes on, things are moving to the left. So from this graph alone, you would expect that what you're really seeing here is some oscillation that's occurring here and then propagating outwards. You know, the difficulty is that uh, that although this all strange as just a G mode, the difference between the G mode frequency is that the G mode frequency and the Schwarz metric, which was computed here, uh, and the maximum is just uh, like one part in 10 to the five. So either you need a very long simulation, and our maximum length of simulation is like 90,000 by nanopod time. And you would need perhaps 200,000, or you can do better, you can go to Kerr. So we went to Kerr, because the difference becomes large. So this is perhaps a point where I should mention the simulations themselves. Let's see, are we getting on time here? We got five minutes. Okay. <laughs> getting there. All right. So, so this, uh, this is a temperature versus surface density disk plot, and the point is that there are two equilibrium branches. One is uh, radiation pressure dominated at thicker disk, and the other is gas pressure dominated at thinner disk. And we run a host of simulations, and all the ones which started on the radiation pressure dominated branch actually uh, collapsed to a pressure dominated one. All the ones that started as pressure domin on the pressure dominated branch essentially stayed there. There was a slight adjustment because the analytic model and the numerical model are not. So this is really what we're interested in, but uh, not the variability state of this, what we like to look at. So this is an example. So this is the initial state, pressure dominated, thin disk. This is the final state, but not to show that pressure dominated. The radiation pressure dominated, thicker disk, collapsed to uh, a gas pressure. Right. So this is the curve simulation. Okay, so let me start with the to relate to your question with the epicyclic frequencies. This is from Bob Wagner's paper. So in the Schwarzschild case, there is the generacy between vertical and orbital frequencies, but the radial epicyclic frequency is different. And this corresponds sort of to the original Reynolds simulation, although they had a pseudo Newtonian one instead of the Schwarzschild. Okay. Let's use a wrap up the spin of the black hole. Get a splitting. I don't know if you can see it, but believe me, there is a splitting of, of the top one. And, and the most important thing is that the highest value of the radial epicyclic frequency goes up because the east coast is Roman. 
Okay, so this is illustrated here. The solid lines are the Schwarzschild orbital and regular epicyclic curves, uh, or, or vertical and regular epicyclic curves, and the dashed ones are for for care at spin point five. And uh, the colors are the power density in the spectrum of the mass accretion rate in our secure simulation. And you can see that there's a lot of power flow in the regular epicyclic curve, so there's a lot of uh, regular oscillation up and below, and then I'm going to magnify it. And you can see there is a clear, clear difference now between where the power is below the maximum and the maximum. So, so and the, and the frequency of this, we go to the frequency of this mode corresponds to the theoretical remote prediction. So I think there's no doubt that this is what's to be involved in, in our current simulation. Right, so let's see. I just mentioned the resonance thing. Okay, so now this is a power density plot again. Okay, so that's its radius not for the mass accretion rate, but for the vertical velocity, like this. So there's not much power, essentially, following the regular epicyclic curve, but there is power, a nice tip of power, increasing as we go on for the vertical epicyclic frequency curve. So indeed, the vertical motions, as expected, uh, follow the vertical epicyclic frequency. So there is an enhancement here, in particular here that you can see. Okay. And the enhancement occurs where the radius is set to the two frequencies of an epigraphy ratio. So indeed in this numerical simulation we do see some evidence for I would say a, a non negative frequency resonance. And I think that's um, that's the other thing. So sorry, one more thing. These are uh, power density spectra at different moments of time, and the point is that the blue occurs uh, towards the end of the simulation. So this enhancement is not visible in the beginning of the simulation, but takes time to build up. Okay, and then the resonance occurs, and then presumably it will decay as, as we want the simulation to be So the sort of conclusion is done. We have performed many hybrid simulations, and we have seen the epicyclic the motions, we have seen the remote, and we have some evidence for the vertical and Questions? Avi? So these oscillations in the disk, they should translate to um, patterns in the jet for uh, radio jets close to the disk at least? Um, which will inform us about the speed of the material as it comes to this. Uh, do we see such things? Right, so uh, here I have to put in a caveat. This was all thin disk simulations, now based on uh, recent simulations with Matic, uh, Ramesh, uh, Deborah Lam, several other gigabytes, etc. We now have to realize that stable accretion drifts. At, at these accretion rates during radiation. You can build a stable radiation pressure supported disk, but you need to, based on uh, Alexandrov's work, you need to uh, add a little bit of magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And then the appearance of the disk changes. Okay, most of the mass is still concentrated close to the center frame, but the, but the photosphere moves up considerably and general panel, so there's a, a new class of, I'd say, a new class of models of, of accretion disk that we need to look at, and, and the timing analysis was not done for it. So I appreciate your question, but I would say that the model that I have presented probably would not address it in a realistic scenario. So this enhancement that you saw at the 3 is to 2 radius, that's very nice. It's the first time I'm seeing mm -hmm. any yeah. real demonstration yes. of this resonance. But presumably there are other ratios that can also be there, like four is to three, mm -hmm. at some other radius. Maybe you can get that, or mm -hmm. for some uh, spins, well, maybe even two is to one. Do you see anything else? I, I have to be honest and say even this one is very weak. 
So, so it will not it's explain. To it, it will not explain the observation that I showed you at the beginning. So, so already you know we are at the limits of, of, of what right. But it, yeah. However, is something for, else. You know, some of those other things are they other resonances? Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. But there is another thing that I should mention that is that, that, that a very strong power strip of the breathing oscillation. And this breathing oscillation is not exactly in, in a light spatial, but very close to, 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 to a ratio like to one in ancient with, with, uh, with one of the other breathing systems. But it's not a mode, it's a local oscillation, so at every rate you should have this. Mm -hmm. But that's so, you know, if for some reason you know, there is an enhancement of some HCD, some this, then they will see in this nice version. It is not a resonance. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. While she's setting up, I'd like to introduce Tiffany Nichols, who's a graduate student working with me over in History of Science, and she has an office here, and she's been uh, assiduously following events in black hole science. Her main work is on the way that noise functions inside the LIGO experiments. And she's interested in the way local noise in the regions around the, uh, the LIGO sites has been handled, how it's registered, countered, both physically and in anti-coincidence, coincidence, coincidence uh, coordination. Uh, she's uh, particularly well outfitted to work on this because she not only has some background in engineering, but also has a law degree, which is very relevant to understanding the regulatory structures uh, <laughs> involved in uh, establishing these sites. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce Tiffany Nichols. So thanks for having me. Um, so I'll get started. So I think I can safely say everyone in the room has been watching the alerts from the third observation run of LIGO. Um, you are not among the people who would think of a car battery part or interchangeable part when you hear the number S19110 um, AF. But we'll provide some detail about this event. Um, so this event was detected on November 10th, so recently, and it's been the only burst alert in O3. So these burst alerts are particularly of interest because they may show gravitational waves originating from an event <coughs> source that we have yet to model. So as a field outsider, I would call this probably new, new physics if it reaches fruition. Um, but as you would expect, Twitter physicists and astronomers turned their attention from politics to the alert. But it wasn't doing the impeachment first. <laughs> it, it was right before. before. Which like, I mean, yeah. The impeachment is also about that known. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I only show these to illustrate um, how excited people became about the alert. So we have not a binary merger, um, what a mystery, exciting times, celebration emoji. Um, I'm going to watch Astro Twitter speculate whilst I eat Nutella. And down here we have, oh man, we have an unmodeled transient. So by the next day, uh, the Fermi Large Array Telescope had completed about a 90% search of the localization information that LIGO provided, and nothing was found. So just as mysteriously as this burst came in, um, it was retracted. It was kicked out. So why do physicists and astronomers, um, and really now the larger public, get so excited about these burst detections? Um, by this point, we sort of forgot that LIGO analyzes data uh, from the perspective of burst detections. And why is that? Well, because LIGO has been announcing so many detections based on waveform template matching, um, which is really the bread and butter of the instrument because it's fast and we can discern information quickly to allow for follow-ons. So during the remainder of this talk, I will provide some background information on why these two methods exist. Um, and it is interesting that the most used method um, wasn't really made robust until after 2005. So I hope to provide some background on why this is. So I have here a timeline, and it's really highlighting um, aspects of the numerical relativity field um, that relate to waveform template matching. 
So 35 years after the publication of Einstein's general theory of relativity, and 34 years after Einstein first proposed the potential existence of gravitational waves, we have Yvon Schachte and Perrot showing that the deployment of gauge manipulations of Einstein's equations change the behavior of the partial differential forms, uh, allowing for less headaches when trying to solve these equations under certain conditions. So this should really be seen as a first look at how we can handle the equations and how we can approach solving them uh, in this future world that we have in computing. So this period also produced the G1 Chapel Hill Conference. So that's where Felix Perani first proposed sort of an experimental scheme for even detecting gravitational waves. Uh, and this is also the period during which Joseph Weber, for example, submitted numerous times to the Babson Gravity Research Foundation, which David Kaiser provided a wonderful history about, about a month ago. So this timeline is not really to scale, but in 1964, we have Shaka Burat and Grosch extending her 1952 <coughs> work to general conditions. And by this time, we see developments on the computing front. So as we all know in this room, solving Einstein's equations is a brain-busting activity. So why not let a brain that can be told what to do and do it comparatively quickly, faster, and more accurately, allow us to gain insights into solving these equations. So just as the star collapse modeling benefited from developments in computing from the Manhattan Project, um, we see similar origins for the, uh, the field of numerical relativity. So in 1969, so we're here now, um, Susan Hahn and Richard Lindquist um, simulate the two-body problem on an IBM 7090 which made it through a whopping 50 steps, that's it. But that was exciting at the time, it was a breakthrough. So to put these computing requirements for such modeling into perspective, the IBM 7090 was used to speed up the design of missiles, jet engines, nuclear reactors, and supersonic aircraft. It was also the same computer that was put to use for the Air Force's ballistic missile warning system and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. So these computers could handle all these other complex problems. Um, but when it came to the two-body problem and Einstein's field equations, they became ill after just 50 steps. Um, so then in the 1970s, Larry Smarr comes along and he starts focusing on how to model black hole behavior and really growing the field of numerical relativity. So in 1977, he models the first head-on collision. Because it was not here, by the way. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so what sorts of equipment was he using? So when he was speaking to an LA Times reporter at the time, um, no American university had such advanced machines for basic academic research. So SMAR had to beg for computer time from friends and military government labs and in Germany where non-military uses of supercomputers were common. So as Smart explained to the reporter, the United States was asleep technologically during the 1970s, and Germany and Japan weren't. So what Germany and Japan did in putting supercomputers into the hands of universities, and especially grad students, was quite logical. Um, by us not doing that, it was quite peculiar. So access to supercomputers was dependent on who you knew and who you could convince to sponsor you. Um, so this, the computing time during this period was about $2,000 an hour, and um, if, you were, if you had a generous federal grant for computing time, it was about $10,000 per year. So think about that. So three of the behind the scenes at the NSF, Richard Isaacson, um, who is also known for his work in funding or getting LIGO funded, SMAR was awarded a $200 million grant from the NSF in 1985. $200,000. Uh, it was 200 million to set, yeah, it was to set up four supercomputing systems in 1985. So those were at UC San Diego, uh, University of Illinois, Princeton, and Cornell. So when I interviewed Richard Isaacson, he said that the gravitational wave physics community needed supercomputing systems, especially with the prospect of the data analysis and the need of modeling to support LI uh, LIGO and other data-rich endeavors within astrophysics. Sorry, so this is the beginning of the Terra grid. This is like the original beginning yes. of the seed and all that. Okay. Yes, yes. Oh, but was it so much money? Or was it? Didn't know. It was for four centers and over a long period of time. Not just a smart. But they survived. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, you can't find these. It, 
So we can think about the 80s as totally risky. We funded the supercomputing system and also Lego. Like in 1989, they got... Was that in today's dollars or... Uh, that's in then dollars, but it's still some of the biggest projects that NSF has yet to fund and still have funded. So just for reference, LIGO was fully funded in 1993, and around this period, the need for waveform templates was evident. So Kip Thorne left his management role in LIGO to tackle this deficiency. So part of this effort was through the Black Hole Grand Challenge. And um, at the start of the challenge, some of the pred predictions were, oh, we need one ter terabyte of data. So that also situates. Um, how much computing power was in place, because they're asking for one terabyte of data. I think I have three terabytes of data in my bag right now. Um, <laughs> so for comparison, numerical rel relativists today are able to run spectral Einstein code simulations on their laptops. So unfortunately, most of the simulations from the Black Hole Grand Challenge resulted in very unstable code. So that is a simulation that Charles Gamme ran a few weeks ago during the colloquium, or in the simulations that you guys run on a regular basis here, was unthinkable in the 90s, or in the mid 90s. And this was the state for additional 10 years. So in interviewing Scott Hughes, who was working on simulations during this period, and wrote a very then controversial paper on the need for waveform templates for LIGO, and he also in the, another paper predicted that the first detection would be the merger of black holes, he attributed this delay to the focus on the code and the belief that computing capabilities would catch up. Um, so it was not until 2005 um, where the field really experienced this much needed breakthrough and that came with Franz Pistorius. So Pistorius focused on how to formulate the equations to allow for modeling through numerical relativity methods um, he made frames co-rotating, minimized the grid, removed similarities, and addressed problems associated with initial condition formulations. So in a talk that he gave at Perimeter Institute in 2005, he stresses that it took a really long time for people to consider the initial conditions as a problem, because whenever there was a crash, it was deemed as a bug in the software rather than a bug in the original formulation of the problem. So I just wanted to highlight the pink boxes are really breakthroughs in how we're manipulating uh, Einstein's field equations uh, to allow for easier use and solving on computers. And then the gray boxes are really breakthroughs in the actual computing power and the code itself. And in the background here, <coughs> LIGO is starting to be formulated. Um, and that's indicated by this blue line here. So during this gap, um, we have Ray Weiss's 1972 RLE report where he suggests that you can use laser interferometry for gravitational wave detection and provides a detailed analysis of the potential noise sources. So therefore, vision, uh, the vision of SMART was key to producing the computing power that would need, be needed to simulate black holes and mergers and also to develop the waveform or the waveform templates that we would need for the future of LIGO. So this allows us to better situate the first prototype observation run of the first instrument that would become the LIGO collaboration. So beginning in the late 1970s through the early 1980s, Weiss amassed enough funding to construct a prototype to show the feasibility of achieving certain sensitivities that would be needed to justify the funding from NSF. So shown here is the first prototype. It's a 1.5 meter prototype that was at MIT, housed in Building 20. So um, being that this device was built uh, during a period when physics, physicists weren't that optimistic about obtaining reliable waveform templates for mergers, they focused instead on how are we going to analyze this data? How are we going to analyze the unknown? Um, so the first run happened on June 3rd through June 10th of 1985. It was in Building 20, uh, which was is now the spot where the Strata Center is. Um, so it was off of Vassar Street, close to Main Street. And you guys are all local here, um, and you know the Cambridge area very well. So the T runs right <coughs> under the spot between Central and Kendall Square. So Rice and his team, mainly through Jeffrey Leibos and Daniel Dewey, ran their <coughs> observations mostly, and this is quote, seismic or during times that were seismically and acoustically quietest times. Lots of superlatives were still. 
Um, so after, and this was after the Cambridge subway closed at 1.30 a.m. But, um, so these marks here are indicating when they actually took data, and they mostly coincide with the nighttime after UT was shut down. But that was not good enough. So the team actually closed Bassett Street to traffic on June 8th and June 9th for two days. So there were two dissertations that resulted from this. So Daniel Dewey applied simple templates and Jeffrey Ligas um, did what became first searches. So here are the templates that Daniel Dewey used. So many of the detections caused by the surrounding environment are due to the equipment in use um, needed to be fully understood. So, because you can see these templates are very rudimentary. So this is a, just a normal sinusoidal wave at the top. So you can see it's picking up a lot of vibrations. So one example of this excess noise, um, Daniel Dewey explains that the buffers and the tape drive motors uh, used to write the data to the tape were initially seen as detections of the template. So this would have been something that would have been retracted. So, but what did, what's really interesting here is this work can be seen as a shift from showing a proof of concept of the ability to build a sensitive device to being able to analyze the data and understand the noise that exists in the environment and identifying it in the data so that it's not being confused for a gravitational wave signal. So another interesting finding is seen here. So Dewey says, I underlined it, this is the most exciting of the isolated events. So does this look familiar to anyone? I'm trying to guess what this detection may have done. So it's 1985. First time they're analyzing data using a laser interferometer. Okay, so at the time, um, the team was very interested in what Larry Smart was doing. And this is one of Larry Smart's first waveforms of a black hole collision, but it's only at the time of collision. So I asked, uh, when I asked Daniel Dean, what is that signal? Uh, he said, the interest slash excitement comes from seeing it seeming to so clearly um, be not just an extension of noise, but it seems to be due to something that happened in the wing phase. So it's left inconclusive. <laughs> but what's the amplitude that is needed to explain? I mean, what, what kind of, how big is that probably? Like, so um, the sensitivity of this 1.5 meter interferometer is about 10 to negative 15 at this point. Mm -hmm. So there is not, no event that can happen close enough. Unless there are two black holes next to the source. So right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that wave looks very much like a yeah. collision. Um, okay. So Dewey finds this promising. So he concludes that template filtering can be done in real time through improved coding algorithms and hardware. So he's highlighting the need for computing power and capabilities. So under are using the same data, uh, Jeffrey Leibos used a different approach, which is similar to what we call the burst search today. As Leibos states, this dissertation memorializes the first attempt to conduct such a search. But based on the results and performance, there is great need for specialized hardware, environmental sensors, and better computing capabilities. So these are all the things that have been implemented in LIGO today in the theoretical physics. It is how to use a more sensitive gravitational wave detector as a different type of telescope rather than just a specialized interferometer. So the spirit of the doctoral thesis emphasizes that this new method of detection and data analysis is to show the presence of unknown sources through methods of showing pulses that are apparent from background noise and then corroborated by coincident instruments. So LIBA starts out with a basic scheme because this was like the first instance of how to even analyze the data in this way. So he computed the estimated power spectrum and then searched for statistically significant peaks. So once those peaks were identified, then astrophysical signals are distinguished from the instrumental resonances and the local disturbances. So, um, in order to make these determinations, he conducted a fast Fourier transform, so changing time-based data to frequency-based data. And the idea is that the statistical distribution of the amount of power will be different if the peak signal is present and then if the signal is merely noise. So this requires some judgment. 
on where to set the threshold and where the candidate signals will appear above that threshold. So from the probabilities of mis mislabeling the noise, missing the signal, and detecting um, the signal, all of those can be determined um, from the scheme. So as Liba states, unfortunately, the statistics of this graph are such that there is no clear-cut choice of the threshold except a high signal-to-noise ratio. So if you were to ask someone like Duncan Brown, who contributed to the development of the birth searches for <coughs> binary neutron star mergers, he would shy away from this language of threshold for what a signal is, or whether a signal is noise or an actual gravitational wave signal, because he's considering factors about what's happening in the surrounding area, and he's also thinking about setting alerts to the probability level of about once per month, because if you do more than that, maybe there won't be any follow-on, because if you cry wolf like four times per month, uh, what will happen? So earlier in the discussion, I mentioned computing power. And so similar computing power was needed for Liveus's analysis of data. Um, and so how did he do that? Because this is a time when we didn't have access to supercomputing systems, we didn't even have a federally funded one. Um, so through computing time, gifted to him by MIT nuclear physics professor, who at the time had a grant um, covering weapons research, Livas first attempted his computing time at Los Alamos. However, this professor lost his funding because a lot of basic research through military funding in the 80s, it dissipated. So Livas applied for time at the University of Minnesota. And Richard Isaacson describes the University of Minnesota's supercomputing system as very forward for the time. Um, because it was privately funded, but if you were doing basic research, you did not have to pay for your computing time. But similar to today, if your code does not mirror the traditions and standards of the supercomputing system, then significant effort is required to learn the system and adjust one's code to be able to run on it. So technologically, Minnesota was the best system for Livebus because it was uh, using a Cray-2, and that Cray-2 was specially designed for handling fast Fourier transforms. So he sent the tapes to Minnesota um, to properly format the data. And he traveled to Minnesota to learn the system. And then from a dial-in connection for the telephone line uh, from Cambridge, using ARPANET, he sent commands to Minnesota to analyze the data. So you can imagine this workflow, um, if you remember connecting to the internet through dial-up days. Um, so <laughs> true to the technology, um, his telephone connections were often dropped and phone noise was often interpreted as a wrong command. So think delete instead of copy. Imagine that. Okay, so although the uh, dissertation provides that housekeeping data was removed, um, I asked for more detail on what this was. So this is a graph, and it was a little bit unexplained in the dissertation, but when I asked Leibos what the housekeeping data was, he said this graph depicted it, and it's basically removal of disturbances in the instrument and due to the environment. So we see some of the same DNA of what LIGO does today uh, being performed in this first run. So once the data or once the housekeeping data has been removed, he can separate the noise curve from the signal and noise curve and set the threshold, which is this arrow. And these far three signals here um, were analyzed for astronomical origin. But as you said earlier, the instrument wasn't sensitive enough to detect, or there aren't sources close enough to Cambridge at the sensitivity of this instrument to be able to detect them. So ultimately, this study, like Dewey's, called for the need for improved computing and memory capabilities. Um, for example, the amount of continuous data that could be recorded um, was limited due to the size of the tapes. Um, so if you guys remember reel to reel, that's about how sensitive the tape is. And I think it only re uh, records like three hours of data. Um, and they were looking forward to the prospect of optical, optical disk storage. So Livas points out that supercomputers are not the only answer to the methods that will uh, address the significant time it takes to analyze the data. Um, so he also calls for more efficient code. And um, these are issues that became re-identified in the 1990s by LIGO. There's a certain psychology here because if you need uh, two solar mass black holes at the edge of the solar system to make a detectable signal, uh -huh. which is roughly what you need, right? Because the signal is nine or a billion times bigger than what we see with LIGO now. Right. How would people even conceive of 
the technique. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense that there are black holes so nearby. You know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. So what, how, why would they separate? Well, um, here, I'll show you. I just think that it shows these slides, but I'll be for you. I will show them. <laughs> so they had uh, people like the program director pounding them. They needed proof uh -huh. that the instrument could scale up eventually. So he was setting metrics on sort of, oh, I didn't put the slide before, but the page before says you have to achieve this sensitivity by this year and this sensitivity by this year. And then you need to do the operation of a gravity wave search for a periodic signal, period known, for hidden curiosities. Yeah, so that's where that came from. So, but of course. It's like, from an administrator rather than from his. Yes. The instructor. Yes. Okay. Um, it's someone who knows the system so that we can get LIGO funded. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm at the conclusion, but I wanted to leave this up here so you guys can read it, because these are Ray Weiss's thoughts on this problem. So in conclusion, I claim that the timing of the concept of LIGO, uh, along with its early conception of burst searches for unknown gravitational wave sources, was not a product of the desire to discover new physics solely, um, but it was also the product of technological limitations related to the field's ability to model two-body systems, which is also tied to computing issues. So in focusing on this portion of the history, rather than the major findings, we can see that numerous individuals are calling for the need of computing power, including those working within NSF like Richard Eigenbitson. So with this in mind, think back to David Kaiser's conclusion about the presence of private funding versus federal funding and also coordinated efforts in funding. So Ligos benefited from privately funded computer systems when he was unable to use a federally funded one. But also Isaacson um, was in a key position to call for funding and construction of the must need, or much needed computing systems. Um, so I think you guys should keep that in mind since we now have a computing cluster here at BHI and it's pretty unencumbered in its use. Um, think about this history like next time you use it. Um, and then the slide I have up here is Ray is projecting how long it would take on his back computer to analyze the entire location of the sky. And he's like, it would take us two years to do one swipe of the whole thing. And he's like, uh, clearly ridiculous in true Ray fashion. So thank you. <laughs> Time for some questions there. I guess the most uh, interesting lesson, as far as I'm concerned, is the theory is, well, at least in this context, was really needed for the, I mean, Ray Weiss is a pure instrumentalist. Yeah. You know, and in order to get traction, mm -hmm. much, I mean, they really needed some theory in the background. Yes. Just, which is interesting, because usually experimentalists say, we don't need theory, we just do our thing, you know, as much as we can, we can push it. Yes. But here it was needed in order to get the funding. Oh, absolutely. So the cool thing about like your observation is Richard Isaacson is talking to all these individuals in gravitation, so not just instrumentalists, but also theorists. Um, so he's hearing Ray gripe about this, because this made it in a couple uh, conversations to Richard Isaacson. But then we have Kip Thorne switching over in 1993 and encouraging some of these postdocs to write a paper to bring the theory and the computing needs together and give a prediction based on 1993 equipment, whether we can even do it and is it foreseeable. Um, so that's where the theory and the computing and the instrumentation really coalesce, yeah. Chef? Yeah, I, what I find really interesting is this last quote here. Okay, this is Ray, can yes. I say that? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting, you can get this interesting theory, as Avi said, you get this amazing instrument. Mm -hmm. and, and analyzing the data mm -hmm. is often a problem this phenomenon called data poisoning, where you just get so much data that you can't yes. really process it. The LSST, well, it's not the telescope you're dealing with just now. They're having problems with uh, challenges with their whole data pipeline because it's such a massive amount of data. Yes. And on the EHT, we're recording petabytes of data. Yeah. And getting that reduced is really a problem. And so you, you do have to take on some risk. Yes. And, and that's what I find in common in LIGO, or let's say something like the PhD, or maybe even LSST, that you have to have faith that something is going to come along to, to bail you out. And NSF yeah. is really instrumental in supporting yeah. this project. Yeah, because NSF is the only body that is willing to take those. <coughs> well, well, there are some other 
people, as wealthy individuals sometimes <laughs> <laughs> take, take some risk on. Yeah. But, but, but you never know quite what's going to happen. The other example I give sometimes is that when the DLA was built, uh, they thought they were going to get maybe 300 to one, uh, one dynamic range images because nobody could come up with cell cal. But after cell cal was made, now we get millions to one dynamic range images from that same instrument. So things do change uh, as history comes along. Other questions? Sir? Yes, Ramesh. So, Tiffany, you showed the 1985 some beautiful waveform that they measured. Yes. Was that the subway? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about this? Yeah, yeah, this one. Was it the subway that went underneath, or what? Uh, what, what it cost it? So, um, they this came on the night when they closed the road, yeah. and they were running when the subway was down. Okay, so it's not that. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we get this this okay. response. Um, something happened. Something. Well, they don't always see things. Maybe <laughs> somebody jumped. Or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you look for patterns that or, you recognize, yeah. and they saw this in the noise. Yeah. And, this... and you have to remember this building 20, so maybe a piece of the ceiling fell down. Ceiling fell down, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll be here, guys, <laughs> maybe one more question. If there, otherwise, thank you very much. Let's thank our thank speaker. You. Thank you. <laughs> Nodded up. Nodded up. Thank you. Yeah.